Hello, and uh, welcome to 213 of the Infinite Knockcast, which will never, ever end until I run out of records, which eventually will happen, of course. Today is Monday, the 27th of June, 2022. I, uh, 30 years ago tonight, I was watching the Sisters of Mercy at the Birmingham NEC on their one-day tour of the UK uh, to support their Some Girls Wander by Mistake compilation album. That's not why I'm here. Today... I'm here to talk about uh, a record by a band that I absolutely love. Well, two records, actually. Or three, depending on your point of view. Uh, Nine Inch Nails and the Broken EP and the Fixed Remix EP, uh, which was released on the 22nd of September, 1992. Now, I have to go back a little bit in time. Uh, Can I get a rewind to talk about the live show? Uh, that I saw that effectively was the tour for the Broken album, uh, although the tour happened about a year before the album was released. Um, I saw the Birmingham show at Birmingham Goldwyns on the 10th of September 1991, uh, which I, uh, to be honest, have barely spoken about in the previous episode when I talked about Pretty Hate Machine, uh, and I, I absolutely, definitively should have talked about it more. So... Uh, in my mind, the album Pretty Hate Machine had been a friend for a, a couple of years. Um, by the time it actually came out in the UK, I had grown to love and live the album. And I had immersed myself in every line and every bleep and every crunch of that album. Uh, this is still an incredible album, life-changingly good. And uh, I, I cannot overemphasize its importance to me. It is in my top 20 records of all time by anybody ever. Frequently in my top 10. Uh, one of my earlier notcasts, I talked through the 20 greatest albums, or the, uh, or the albums that have had the biggest influence on me. Pretty Hate Machine is definitely in that 20. And uh, without wishing to go over old ground too much, in 1991, I had just reached, I suppose, a degree of maturity. Legally, I was an adult. Uh, I'd had my first adult relationship, which ended catastrophically um, through no decision or fault of my own I was cheated on uh, by somebody who was also young and immature um, and it was done in such a way that it was it could have there is obviously no great way um, to be cheated on but uh, the way that it happened in 1991 seemed absolutely careless about the damage and hurt and pain that it would inflict upon anybody around it um, very much like a nuclear bomb going off in your back garden. There's going to be a lot of damage. Uh, and and the, you know, there was, and there's you know, fallout that still lasts to this day around that. Uh, but this record, I think, really felt to me like it understood that sense of, of injustice. Um, it felt that hurt. Um, and seeing Nine Inch Nails, I'd heard rumours that their live show was very different and much louder than the records, I had no idea how much louder it would be. So I listened to the, the bootleg recording, the tape uh, recorded at Birmingham Goldwyns on the 10th of September. Today, actually, uh, walking back from, uh, from, a, from a, a trip. And um, what I remembered when I heard that was just firstly how different the songs were when played live. And secondly, how much the sound of the live band became the sound of the broken record. So listening to, to the live tape, um, what I heard was a live drummer, not a program drummer. And that live drummer, uh, Jeff Ward, was adding parts into the song. So actually, when I listen to the studio recordings of Nine Inch Nails, uh, pretty hate machine songs, I think they're wrong now. So there's you know particular drum breaks that are in the middle of tracks like Sin, um, Down In It, Head Like A Hole. There's, there's guitar parts that are added to things like Terrible Lie. And there's guitar parts that are on the Sin remix as well and to me when i hear those songs now without those guitar parts in it feels to me like those songs are naked and they're they're not really the, the way that they should be very strange way of looking at it but to me that live tape became the definitive version of pretty hate machine uh, and during that show the band played three songs which i hadn't heard four four songs actually which i hadn't heard before those songs being now i am nothing wish physical and a cover of uh, Suck by Pigface. Um, and I have to talk about those four songs in the context of what became the album, which they later turned on. As it turned out, three of those songs were released on the Broken EP. And one of those songs is still to this day 
unreleased by Nine Inch Nails. That song is Now I Am Nothing. And as far as I'm concerned, Now I Am Nothing is one of the greatest Nine Inch Nails songs. It's only two minutes and 12 seconds long, but it is a phenomenal song. Um, it was the first song I saw Nine Inch Nails play live. They played it live the last time I saw Nine Inch Nails. Uh, and that they played it live in 2018 as well on the Cold and Black and Infinite tour. So even though it's a song that's never been released, it's definitely a song that has not left the band's consciousness. Um, and so when I saw them play it, Now I Am Nothing, which is the logo that was on the back of their T-shirts for the tour. Uh, but also the title of that song is the initials of the band itself. Mid. It's almost as if it's, a, I think, one of the, the band's most definitive, defining songs, even though most people that aren't absolute Nine Inch Nails geeks like me um, haven't actually heard it. Um, it's a song that basically consists of a, a very basic drum pattern, a rising synthesizer section that builds to attention, and then all of a sudden the whole song explodes and it goes into terrible light. But what's important about that is that it is, most, firstly, one of the greatest intros of all time. Why it wasn't the intro on this, I, I have no idea. In fact, when Now I Am Nothing didn't appear on this, I was like, ah, oh, he's saving it to open the next album. And uh, if you listen to, to Now I Am Nothing, you can kind of feel that it would meld perfectly into Mr. Self-Destruct, the first track from the Townwood Spiral. But Now I Am Nothing is one of the greatest Nine Inch Nails songs. It has all of the key elements that you would expect. It almost feels, in fact, like it's like it's some kind of um, precursor of all the motifs which would turn up in other Nine Inch Nails songs. So that the lyric about, I smash myself into pieces, that's used in March of the Pigs. There's a line about sifting through the ashes, that's used in Burn. Uh, there's a line about what I have become, which is one of the key lines in Hurt. Um, there is the line about, I let it slip away, now I am nothing. Uh, and, and slipping away is also both um, a key lyric inside the song, Into the Void, and the remix called Slipping Away, but also kind of lends itself to the 2008 album, The Slip, the concept of letting go and losing something that, that existed. Um, there's also the line about, I break myself in two, which is from the song In Two, and, uh, which, which is on hesitation marks. Also, one of the key lyrics in Now I Am Nothing is, is the, you know, the, the pre-chorus where he goes, wave, wave goodbye to what I have become. And wave goodbye was both the name of the band's uh, farewell tour uh, when they first decided they were going to split up in 2009 uh, and almost became the, the kind of like the catchphrase for that era of the band. That's the wave goodbye, uh, giving somebody the slip, um, which obviously is also the name of the album that they were touring at the time the slip being i think the slip is a fantastic name for a nine inch nails album especially their final studio albums because when you give somebody the slip you escape from them but at the same point when you give somebody the slip there's also here's your slip it's a phrase which is used in employment it's like this is your last paycheck this is the slip that you get so um, that phrase has a uh, a strong meaning and um, kind of that runs through the album as well well, I'm not talking about the slip. I'm talking about Broken, the uh, the Nine Inch Nails album, uh, which was both an EP and generally regarded as their second album, even though it only contains six songs and 22 minutes of music. This is the uh, the 1992 UK vinyl edition of the album. Uh, it was not released on vinyl in the US, and it was a single-sided record. Uh, some copies came with a seven-inch single of Physical and Suck. Some copies didn't. My copy didn't. Um, and the, the first two tracks, well, the first three tracks from the album that I heard were Wish, Physical and Suck. Not necessarily in that order, uh, but it's important to, to kind of mention that the tracks Physical and Suck uh, were Nine Inch Nails recordings. And they were songs which were intended for a standalone 12, which was due to be released in 1991 to go alongside the Lollapalooza touring, almost as a, a kind of a, a joining piece between... Pretty Hate Machine, and whatever came next. Because by the time we got to the end of the Pretty Hate Machine at Birmingham Goblins and, and the London Astoria, the album had been out in the US for two years. The band had been touring for three years. They were knackered, they were fed up, and they were furious. Um, and for me, obviously, watching them at Goldwyn's and having gone through that horrific experience of finding out I was being cheated on by, by walking into a room and, and finding someone mounting the person I thought was my girlfriend like they were a butterfly, which was pretty awful. Um, it's not an image that, firstly, 
you ever want to see. It's not an image that you can ever forget if you have seen it. You know, like um, in the very early days of the internet, you know, Rotten.com, which had photographs of, you know, car crashes and some guy that had tried to kill himself and failed and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It was one of those things that once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. So I can still see it now very, very clearly. If that's what I want to do, I don't want to do. I generally don't think about it, but it is a thing that happens. And so when I saw the Goldwyn show, um, to me, it felt like an exorcism. It felt like I had the ability to, to scream it all out in a very, very positive way, um, which is something that also ties in with Metallica's St. Anger album and the band Idols, who, of course, only like them for their T-shirts. Um, but the, the concept that you can work through you know, the issues and the injustices by, by air and grievances. Uh, you know, that gig was a safety valve that kept me sane. I was still damaged and hurting as a result of the betrayal that had been visited upon me, but I had a chance to do some, some kind of musical bloodletting almost throughout the course of that show. Uh, but the, the four songs which the band played, obviously one still hasn't come out to this day, which is frankly Criminal Trent released Now I Am Nothing Now. All right, maybe not. Um, but uh, the three other ones, Physical Suck and Wish, um, were songs that I thought, ah, they're going on the next album. Uh, and so I lived on the bootleg tape of Wish. The live version of Wish from 1991 has a different arrangement, by the way. It has a different guitar riff right at the beginning, uh, which, because I, I listen to it so often, to me, the version on the, on the record of Broken feels a little bit wrong. But um, there we are. And Broken was very, very much inspired by the sound of the live band that the band had. Um, it was a you know an exercise in frustration. The band were very very frustrated by their commercial position, not their success, but by their commercial position. The label they had been on TVT um, had felt that they were starting to say to the band, "No, you need to do something that's more commercial, something that's more accessible. You can't be the best Nine Inch Nails that you can be. You have to be a popular version of a band like Knights of Red. We want you to be a bit more Depeche Mode." That is probably the type of conversations that were happening between Trent and the uh, the band's label uh, guy. I think his name was Steve. Um, I think his name was Steve, and you can see the words "fuck you, Steve." Uh, on a computer screen in one of the videos that goes alongside one of the songs for the Broken EP. And I, although officially Broken was recorded between March and August 1992 at a number of studios, including one that sounds suspiciously like it was a tour stop halfway through the Pretty Hate Machine tour, and I think it was Vienna, it was um, officially recorded between March and August 1992 because of the the end of the, the, the negotiations, there was a legal battle between Trent and the band's for, um, label, where Trent's basically going, look, let me bloody leave. Either let me make the records I need to make, or let me go and make the records somewhere else. Uh, it's a very similar kind of um, di dilemma that Ministry had when they did uh, Twitched and In Sympathy, or Twitch, uh, where they, they, they started off sounding like one band, and by the end they sounded a very, like someone very, very different, and to be honest, far better and far more honest. There was a, you know, a concept that, let's say you are in your 20s or your 30s and you are forced to do things for money and then the thing which you love becomes a job. And I think Trent had felt that maybe he was being forced to do things in exchange for money that he didn't want to do and that had become a job. And so things like complete artistic control, complete um, artistic intent, the ability to make the records that he wanted to make became very, very, very important as opposed to, well, I'm not just, you know, your singing, barking seal. You put, I'm not your performing little monkey. Um, and the fact that TVT wouldn't release Physical or Suck as a 12-inch around about the time that a lot of Palooza came out just meant that those tracks got shelved and they got released on Broken. Um, copies of Broken came with a 7-inch single that had Physical and Suck on it. Some copies of the CD has a 3-inch CD involved. Uh, international copies of the CD had them as tracks 97 and 98 on a 99 song cd which was the most songs that you could get on a cd um, so there you have it the reason that there wasn't a three inch cd on any of the international copies of broken that i know of was because actually it would make the cd um, uneconomical to produce the three inch cd was a dying format and it would have ended up having to cost something like 20 pounds in order to make it viable so it was a yeah uh, a decision to release it in that form. Now the sound that we have for the Broken EP reflects very much the live sound of the band. Um, it was largely a change in songwriting style, apart from Happiness in Slavery on Broken, 
all of the songs were written on guitar. So Happiness and Slavery was written in the standard fashion, which was drum machine and keyboards. And that's the most obviously electronic and straightforward of the songs on the album. Songs like Wish, Last, uh, Gave Up. Those are all songs which, when you listen to them, the, 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 the music is very clearly written on a guitar. So, for example, think about songs written by Johnny Marr. Think about Oscillate Wildly and think about, let's say, This Charming Man. In theory, you could have written This Charming Man on a piano, but it wouldn't have been written on a piano because you listen to the combination of the songs and the, the notes and the melodies and the speed which is going to is a heck of a lot easier. I'm going to play an air guitar now. It's a heck of a lot easier to go than it is to go on a piano and do it. And in the same kind of function, Oscillate Wildly, which is largely a piano-led instrumental, was very clearly Johnny Marr sitting at a piano, writing a song on the piano, and then putting all the notes together. And I don't know how to explain this, but you can hear, when you listen to a song, the instruments upon which it has been played. So, for example, the core riffs that are in songs like Last, Gave Up, Wish, those are songs that, you, if you sat down at a piano and wrote a song, you would not write those riffs. Those are songs that come out of playing with a guitar and, and, and just going through various things with your fingers, and then also going... Perfect. That's the one, you know. And sometimes when you play a riff, especially if you're writing a song, you just know that's a keeper. That is a good bit of melody there. And there are different melodies which present themselves because obviously you're playing a keyboard as opposed to how you're playing a guitar. Not very technically described at all, but I am an enthusiast and an amateur, not a professional or an expert on these things. Uh, you don't want to hear me play guitar. I don't want to hear me play guitar, but I know that when you play guitar, you make different sounds, different chord structures and different melodies and different speeds and rhythms than when you write with pianos. So if I listen to a song, I can very easily go, that was written on a piano, that one was written on a guitar. I don't know how, I can just tell. And so the three songs on, on Broken that were written on guitar are Wish, Last and Gave Up. And you can tell when you listen to them, they're guitar songs. That is the dominant instrument upon which they were written. And the sound that we have for the album Broken uh, is very, very different to the sound that you have on Pretty Hate Machine. First and foremost, Pretty Hate Machine sounds exactly like what it is, which is an album made by somebody working at the very limits of the limited technology that they have available to them. For Broken... Trent was largely recording guitar through a zoom pedal and feeding it into a turbo synth and then he was manipulating the sounds of the guitar so it still sounds like a guitar but it sounds like no guitar you've ever heard it sounds like a guitar somehow glimpsed in a mirror through an alien dimension or something it is it's guitar but not as you know it Jim um, and there's a, a, a bunch of frequencies and extra sounds and textures that sit in there. Now, I, I've downloaded all the Nine Chanel multitracks that are available, uh, and I've been able to download the multitracks for Last and for Wish, and you're able to, to listen to those multitracks and hear all the bits of the song that aren't actually the song. And one of the things that Trent is an expert at is layering, and that is texture. That's adding things which just add a little bit of flavour, a little bit of spice to the to the song, in much the same way as when you eat, let's say, a spaghetti bolognese. I love spaghetti bolognese, but maybe not so much as to Google the recipe for it whilst watching The Cure play their smallest UK show in 25 years, unlike certain people that I stood behind at the Royal Festival Hall show, who I still find very, very annoying even now. Um, but when you, you think about spaghetti bolognese, obviously you think about spaghetti, you think about minced meat, you think about sauce, but you don't think about necessarily the spices, the textures, the cheeses, the peppers, all those things that go into it. Uh, Trent is very, very good at the, not just obviously writing the songs, but also the, the peppers and the spices and the cheeses and, and the grating and the flavour and the texture, the extra bits that just make it just a little bit better. And everything else and in fact if you want to hear where Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross who is now a member of Nine Shells are amazing at texture to listen to the soundtrack albums because effectively you're almost listening to the songs with all of the songs taken out just the textures and they're absolutely fascinating to listen to purely from a sonic perspective as opposed to maybe a song perspective I've gotten distracted. We need to talk about this album, and I've barely touched upon it. The other thing about the production that we got for Broken uh, is that it says on the sleeve that it should not be listened to on mono devices. Uh, and the reason that it should not be listened to on mono devices, by the way, is because of, it says here, caution, do not use on mono devices. There, there you go. Uh, yeah, have a look at it in the sleeve. Maybe that'll make the, the, the cover look a little bit better. But there what we have is 
And the reason this is not to be used on mono devices is because mono devices have a different image to a stereo sound. Um, if you really want to get really techy about it, I'm sure there are 10,000 YouTube videos about the difference between the Beatles stereo mixes and the Beatles mono mixes and about how uh, John yelps differently during the middle of I'm the Walrus or something. I, I don't know if he does. I'm guessing at this point. Um, but uh, the mono version of this, if you play this on a mono speaker, so for example an old-fashioned television, an old-fashioned radio, what you'd find is because the way that the, the sound is phased between the two speakers is that it sounds like a very, very different, very distorted mix. Apparently, Happiness in Slavery, if you play it on a mono device and not a stereo device, um, it almost cancels out the snare drum sound because of the phasing between the two speakers. It squashes it down as it tries to squash the stereo sound into a mono. I must admit, I don't fully understand it. If I did, I'd be an audio engineer. Uh, but that's the type of stuff that makes my little geek cat ears kind of perk up like the invisible sound at the end of the Beatles LP that drives the dog nuts. I go, ooh, ooh, oh, oh, that kind of thing. Um, and that's the type of stuff that I absolutely love. Is, is manipulating and playing with sound on the studio that I've got and clearly Trent is doing exactly the same thing here and and what we do have then is uh, for example on TVs and radios these songs don't sound quite so good uh, but if you listen to them on, on stereo images they sound proper if that makes sense Broken is a fabulous album it was it didn't quite reflect exactly where I was when it came out, but it reflected who I had been. So it was released in September 1992. In September 1992, I was 10 months into my, my first proper adult relationship uh, where I was treated with dignity and respect by a wonderful person who um, I think is one of the finest human beings I ever had the privilege to meet. Um, hopefully they think the same about me. It didn't work for a number of reasons. Um, but the main one, frankly, was distance. We lived 150 miles apart, and you could only do that for so long. Um, but uh, it was a very positive place that I was in. I, I, I was um, much, much happier when this album was released than when I'd seen Nine Inch Nails a year previously. So I listened to it, and it, whilst it didn't quite connect with who I was, I most definitely connected with the the version of me that I used to be a year before. And so I listen to this album. I love this album, but I can't listen to it without thinking about the guy that I was in 1991 and how he was hurting and alone uh, as a betrayed 18-year-old in suburban Birmingham. Obviously, Birmingham being the home of metal, I had to like music with guitars. That was the law. I don't make the laws. I just make the rules. That's just the rules. If you grew up in Birmingham, you had to like heavy metal, at least until about 1994 or thereabouts, unless you were my dad, at which point, of course, um, you'd think that the best way to listen to the Beatles was with earmuffs, much like Sean Connery in Goldfinger. He was wrong about that as well. And so what we had with Broken was just this fantastic, short, pummeling assault of music that was really derived out of the very frustrated position that the band was in. The point is, is I've got to the point where I've worked my way up from absolutely nothing. I'm able to tour and make it work and able to you know, have a band that has a longer term plan. I'm able to release records and my fucking label are forcing me uh, to release stuff that sounds like Depeche Mode. And so screw you guys. There was a court battle. Uh, Trent got released from his contract, presumably in exchange for paying the guy a load of money. Um, and uh, then released this. In a, he signed to Island Records very, very quickly indeed. Even though this this copy does have the TVT logo on, presumably it might have been a contractual thing, where TVT and Island paired up. And Island went, okay, you can get a percentage and you can get your logo on the back of the record. Just checking. I don't think that uh, the Downward Spiral has the Island logo on. Let's quickly check. Oh, sorry, I don't think it has the TVT logo on. It would help if I opened it. Uh, I don't think it does, you know. This is the de deluxe edition of uh, the Downward Spiral released in uh, 2004. Apparently it's remixed and remastered in high resolution stereo and 5.1 surround sound. This does not have the TVT logo on it. So uh, I guess as the, um, the guidance on the inner booklet for Broken says, uh, the slave finds himself released only to find himself in a stronger pair of chains, I think is the phrase that's on here. Oh, the slave thinks he's released from bondage only to find a stronger set of chains. Well, so there you go. So what you have actually is, you know, moving from, from uh, TVT, who told him what to record, to Ireland, who still obviously is commercial consideration. Um, they wouldn't have signed any band if they didn't think they'd make a load of money out of it. But obviously in the post-Nirvana environment, what you're finding is that labels were signing 
any old tot and releasing it. You know, you'd have uh, bands like Pavement and Sonic Youth, not really vastly commercial bands, um, and, uh, you know, other bands which were considerably worse, I think it's fair to say, uh, were being signed for enormous amounts of money. And if even if your band is weird and esoteric, let's say Mr Bungle, who I absolutely love, but there was no way that they had the same commercial prospects as, say, Faith No More. But they, they apparently were paid an awful lot of money in their deal because, hey, it's a singer from Faith No More, and Faith No More sounds amazing, and they sold loads of records, and they didn't realise that actually Mike Patton is king of the weird. In the nicest sense of the word, so they signed a huge deal with Warner Brothers because no band is going to go, hey guys, pay us less money. They're going to go, oh, thanks, we'll have the check. And uh, then it's, well, it's your problem now, isn't it? Well, we've got the money, um, is one way of looking at it. And so maybe that was the thing that drove Broken. I barely talked about the album. It opens with Pinion. Pinion is um, a wonderful track. It's not a song, um, but it's about a, a, an ascending riff that gets louder and louder and more and more complex over time. Only about a minute long. I've seen them open with Pinion a number of times, and you always know when they open with Pinion, it's going to kick right off. It's not like they're going to be opening with a slow song and building up. If they open with Pinion, it's going to it's going to it's going to hit, and uh, you know it's. As, a, as that famous meme says, let's open this pit up. Um, then the track two is Wish, that song that I saw them play live at Goldman's. Wish is one of the very best Nine Inch Nails songs. It's a brilliant song. Uh, he won a Grammy for it. Uh, features a, a line about fist fucking. Um, where he goes, let's think, it says, um, so um, no new tale to tell. 26 years on my way to hell. Um, God had listened to me and I've had a bad, a bad hard line, bad luck, fist fuck. Um, don't you think you're having all the fun? You know me, I hate everyone. <laughs> it's almost as if it's a parody of a Nine Inch Nails song. But at the same point, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and it, uh, my band used to play it live in rehearsal. Always absolutely knocked it out of the park. Fantastic song to play. So much fun. Great fun to listen to as well. Uh, and then the, the song after that is Last. Last is a brilliant track. Um, I, as I said, I listen to the multi-tracks and there's this brilliant, dark, deep, sultry kind of almost industrial funk that goes underneath the song. Um, I remixed it. Uh, I put it on my mix cloud. I'll put a link to the remix down there. Um, but it is uh, just a phenomenally good track last uh, although i don't think the band played it until 2007 which is pretty crazy or all, all things to be fin uh, all things considered but of course um you know it, it opens the line with gave up trying to figure it out my head got lost along the way worn out from giving it up my soul i pissed it all away of course i pissed it all i, oh, I let it slip away now i am nothing um uh, and it's about a soul i mean the song is around just all of the songs on the album are struggling around identity, integrity, agency, control, being able to, to influence, being able to be able to make your own decisions, being able to stand free of, of being told what to do, you know, which is obviously is a theme which runs all the way through Head Like a Hole. A number of the songs on Pretty Hate Machine. It's about the power dynamic between individuals, the battle between what the individual wants and what their circumstances dictate and define them to have. Um, it's just a Fantastic track. I absolutely love it. Um, now, I would say flipping over to side two, but this is a single-sided 12-inch and, of course, a single-sided CD. So um, you have to go with just side one. And side one, then, and bearing in mind this is the UK vinyl edition from 1992, goes with Help Me, I Am Hell, a track I have not seen the man play live, um, even though they played it a lot in 1994. I didn't see them in 1994 because I was dirt poor. And I can't do anything about that. If I could do one thing for me, um, practically, if I could send money back in time to me, I most definitely would. But I can't do that. So instead, I'm going to buy the records now that I wanted to buy then. Um, but now, and then it goes with Happiness in Slavery, which is, again, um, the song that was written on keyboards and, and drum machines and things like that. Not played live until 1994. Um, and it, it's about, uh, you know, again, control, happiness in slavery, about you know, submission and um, uh, all, all the things that go with it. You know, it's got, there's this line about, I stick my hands through the cage of this endless routine, just some flesh course, caught in this big broken machine. And um, the, all the music drops out to the bit where he sings this break, big broken machine, just these 
echoing ghosts of words that follow and then the whole thing kicks back in uh, and it totally kicks off apparently happiness in slavery is put technically a complete banger live i don't know i've not seen it uh, and then the last track is is gave up a song that i saw them play at least three times on the fragile tour uh, between 1999 and 2000 it would have been four but thanks to a drug overdose, uh, overdose trent uh, um, I didn't get to see them for the fourth time at Docklands Arena. So there we have. And again, Gave Up is around all that energy and all that fury and kind of going, all that was for nothing. That battle was for nothing. I just, you know, it's like punching a wall. Is I, I, or when you play tennis against the wall, that wall is relentless. It never stops. You, you'll never win. And it's like, I did all of that and I didn't get anywhere. Or what, what was it all for? You know, and of course, Gave Up closing the album um it also kind of has has a line in with the uh the opening lines of the uh the last song which is somewhere on this is gave up trying to figure it out my head got lost upon the way and then of course gave up being the, the sixth song on the album the last song on the album they rhyme as uh, that guy from the star wars documentary said they rhyme but they do and you know it's it's a it's a it's a fantastic album so i i think of of um broken as you know certainly got as much in it and as much going for it as any Nine Inch Nails album it's phenomenal records uh, I wouldn't say it was life-changing you know as I said before Pretty Hate Machine was like being hit by a bolt from the blue uh, in the uh, in in the Blues Brothers movie uh, and I'm obviously John Belushi carries up going hallelujah I've seen the lights you know I've torn the lights it is terrible and I'm angry and furious and pissed off and I want to smash everything into tiny little pieces um, but no it's a, a great EP um, I wish it had come out a, a year earlier it would have been so so comforting for me to know that I wasn't the only person that was absolutely fuming about everything uh, but also particularly about the injustices that have been visited upon me uh, Broken, of course, got a CD release. Here is the UK CD release in the trifold pack, uh, which opens up. Not a cheap bit of uh, packaging. Uh, I really miss the days of fantastic CD packaging, by the way, uh, but it, it presents itself like that. And this is the one that has physical and suckers tracks 97 and 98 on the 99 track. CD. Boy, I got bored of pressing those. I ended up doing the repeat button or the, the endless loop button on a certain CD player so you could just press backwards about three times and you could get to the songs as opposed to having to go forwards uh, 90 something times. And then, of course, I recorded it to cassette tape, which was the way that I listened to it whenever I was out of the house. Uh, but this is, um, yeah, a fabulous little release. So glad it came out. Uh, the album had a couple of things that came with it. There was a promotional single for Wish. Here is the UK 7-inch single with the radio edit of Wish. I think I paid £2 for this from HQ. HQ Records, where my, my brother uh, were, what eventually ended up working when he was working as a record guy. Uh, it's a one-sided 7-inch single of Wish, IS522A1. Um, contains the radio edit with the words, Fist Fuck Silenced. Um, so there you go. I uh, probably worth a fair chunk of money now. I have no idea actually. I don't uh, look. I don't. When I think about my records, I don't think about how much they're worth. I think about how much they're worth to me, which is probably the more important way of looking at it. And instead of a commercial single, because obviously you can't put a single off a six-track EP, uh, came the remix album uh, Fixed. Uh, and Fixed was released in December 1992. Uh, which features um, various interpretation of songs that appear in their proper form on the Broken EP, according to the, this lyric. This is the UK 12-inch version of Fixed. Um, no inner sleeve on my copy. Uh, again, replicates the, uh, the, uh, the, the Broken album, but presents it in blue instead of orange, and uh, features six remixes. So it features Gave Up Remix by Coil with Danny Hyde, uh, Wish Remix by J.G. Furwell, who is... Uh, fetus, as in the artist called, amongst other things, Scraping Fetus Off the Wheel, uh, Happiness in Slavery, which is remixed by Trent Reznor and Chris Renner with PK, PK uh, being a guy who remixed Knights of Reb and was an engineer on Alan Wilder of Depeche Mode's uh, Recoil project and also a member of Recoil Live. Then we have track four, which is Throw This Away, which is Trent Reznor and Chris Renner with Butchvig, and there is a full-length Butchvig remix of uh, 
the song in particular, um, last I believe it is, which is basically just like a garbage track, but with Trent Reznor singing on it. It's a, a fabulous remix, um, but it was junk because it was just too commercial. Uh, it was first published in 2007 on remix.nim.com by Trent himself, um, uh, which has now been deactivated the whole of the remix side. Then we have uh, Fistfuck, the uh, second remix of Wish, remixed by Joju Furwell. And finally, Screaming Slave, which is the remix of Happiness is Slavery, uh, which is remixed by Trent Reznor, Chris Brenner, Sean ben Bevan and Bob Flanagan and a number of other people. Sean Bevan um, got the job from producing Orange Now and worked on uh, Guns N' Roses' Chinese Democracy album. Uh, but also, um, yeah, uh, gave up, by the way, uh, the opening remix on this track is, is just brilliant. I love the remix of Gave Up by Coyle that's on here. Uh, it's not the only remix of Gave Up by Coyle, but I love this particular remix because amongst other things, what it does is it actually it takes the, the vocal and it cuts it up and chops it and, and pastes and, and kind of like reverses individual words within the vocal track and then presents them in the song. So it, it's obviously Trent Reznor singing Gave Up, but at the same point, it's bent and broken and distorted beyond all recognition. Kind of like if you dimly recognise something that you see through the fog, it's still the thing, but obviously it's not the thing, it's a different thing. Yeah, that was very articulate, wasn't it? Maybe I should do some of those English lessons for people what don't speak good. Um, but no, Fixed is a, yeah, a, a, an essential remix album, and the first of the, the Nine Inch Nails remix albums that was released, uh, and the first one which kind of picks up the the thread uh, which has run all through Nine Inch Nails' its career which is that remixes are brilliant and we should always have more of them because uh, there were remix albums for, for Downward Spiral, for the Fragile, uh, for the Year Zero album, the multi-tracks of all the albums uh, of, well, the multi-tracks of The Slip, Ghosts, Year Zero, With Teeth, uh, some of the Fragile, uh, the Downward Spiral, some of the songs off Pretty Hate Machine, some of the songs off Broken Raw released so people could, could do their own remixes. Um, and remix culture is a big part of Nine Inch Nails, or has been until relatively recently. There is one more release uh, from this period that didn't actually come out until 2012. Um, and this is the, uh, the, the remix EP uh, by the band Coil called Nine Inch Nails uh, Recoils. And uh, there was a... Um, a number of unfinished gats of remixes of uh, Gave Up and uh, a number of other songs that being Closer, The Downward Spiral and Eraser uh, from the Downward Spiral album. Um, and these songs were prepared and remixed by Coyle. Maybe the mixes weren't finished, uh, but in 2012, somebody asked Danny Hyde, who is uh, a member of the band's, uh, or manages the band's archive now because Coyle split following the death of the two members. Uh, one in 2004 and one in 2010. Uh, so Danny Hyde went back to the original dats of the unfinished mixes which they hadn't presented to Trent, recreated those mixes um, and they were then licensed uh, for this unusual remix EP. Um, there's a download version of it which features about 24 different remixes of Gave Up uh, but there's also these particular CD editions uh, called Recoils, which if you don't have it and you think, I really need some more Nine Inch Nails remixes in my life, and face it, who doesn't want more Nine Inch Nails remixes? I certainly do. Um, then you have a, a great opportunity to pick up some more ones that sound just as good as the ones that did come out, but these ones didn't come out, and they were finished, polished off, and presented for release in 2012. These are basically taken from that, some unfinished mixes and recreated uh, by Danny Hyde. There are a number of vinyl editions of Recoils, by the way. I should point out to the wary is that these uh, there's a brown splatter vinyl version that apparently is a terrible quality. The picture disc is very noisy. The black vinyl version is the one with the most authentic audio reproduction of the sound. Um, and this takes uh, its cue for, in terms of cover art from the Downward Spiral era. When I talk about the Downward Spiral album, um, which I'll probably talk about for an incredibly long time indeed, um, then I will, will go into the Recoil DP in more detail. But the Recoil DP is um, you know, essential listening for fans of Nine Inch Nails. Some copies are still available um, and some copies aren't. I imagine I think the splatter vinyl, even though it's apparently got some pressing errors, is apparently very rare and very expensive. I don't need that. I buy records to listen to them, not to stick them on a shelf and tell everyone about, look at the colours, smell the labels. I knew a guy who did that. He was a jerk. Anyway, 
that is Nine Inch Nails Broken Album and the Fixed Remix EP and all the other stuff that goes with it. Uh, I can't believe I've spent 40 minutes talking about it because this is longer than the EP um, itself. Didn't know quite I was going to do that, but there you are. Don't worry. When I talk about Flaming Lips 24 hour song Skull MP3, I will not talk about it for 36 hours. Thank God for that um, because I won't. I just can't. I haven't got it in me. Um, but there we are. So Nine Inch Nails, Broken and Fixed. Um, effectively, their second album, even though it's officially an EP. Um, I really love this record and um, it's been a friend to me for 30 years now. It's hard to believe it's almost 30 years old. Um, and uh, I hope you love it as much as I do, because that's quite a lot. And we always need records that we can love in this world. Uh, next episode... No idea what that's going to be yet. No idea what I'm going to do it. No idea what it's going to be about. It's been a week since the last one. I have a life that exists outside of this screen, uh, which I am both going to not apologise for and can't avoid even if I was going to. So I do these when I want to, how I want to. The other thing I will say, uh, apparently YouTube only plays out when you've got a 1,000 subscribers. I have under a 1,000 subscribers. So like and subscribe. And I might actually get some money from YouTube for all of these my viewing average in terms of the number of hours i've got definitely works out that i might actually get a shekel or two from youtube uh, so do subscribe if you don't already uh, it will help me um i now understand why everyone goes like and subscribe uh, but of course i don't have the song that's adam buxton's song it's a very good song and i liked it broken is a very good album and i like this take care of yourselves and each other stay beautiful and i will see you soon adios amigos